Good morning. Um, thank you very much for inviting me here to speak. Um, I'm going to go straight into it because I know time's short um, and uh, just a little bit of context there for you. This is the uh, visible hand of the market as opposed to the invisible hand of the market. Um, this is Middlesbrough Institute of Modern Art, where I took over as director two years ago. The museum was built 10 years ago um, in, uh, in the north of England. And Middlesbrough, like every other town at this moment, in the sort of, in the millennial moment, wanted its Guggenheim. It wanted its Tate, it wanted its contemporary art gallery, its modern art gallery, to show it was a player in the world. And Middlesbrough Institute of Modern Art is one of those. It has a collection, but it has a very Kunsthalle-driven exhibitions program, or had to, had, did have until, until I started. Um, but I was conscious when I started the job that MIMA was symptomatic of most modern contemporary art institutions in operation right now, particularly in the UK, where we'd got a model that was designed in the 19th century working for a contemporary situation or a post-contemporary situation. So we needed to rethink what was going on particularly in somewhere like Middlesbrough. This is the map I used to show where Middlesbrough is, and since June last year, it also shows where Middlesbrough is ideologically as well as geographically. So we're up in the northeast of England. The black spot, the heart of the Brexit vote, is Middlesbrough, Teesside, um, an industrial heartland that is now non-industrial. This is the reason Middlesbrough exists, which is one of the largest steelworks in the UK, which one year ago closed when its Thai owners, SSI, shut the plant for good due to the global marketplace in steel, dominated by China's dumping of steel uh, on the international markets. So what was once the reason for the town existing no longer exists. It's gone for good. It will never, ever come back. What this has resulted in, which was already happening, was the deindustrialization and deculturalization of the of the, of the of the region to the point where Middlesbrough became known as Britain's Detroit with the most kind of uh, ex accentuated conditions currently in play that we see all over the uh, all over the western world right now this is uh, this is one of the housing neighborhoods in Middlesbrough that's been demolished but with no particular reason no plan for what might happen next just because they didn't know what to do with it and one of the largest influxes of migrants and asylum seekers in the country. In fact, Middlesbrough has the highest percentage of asylum seekers per capita in the country. It's over its legal limit in terms of what's allowed and hit the headlines um, very recently um, when it was realized that every house holding asylum seekers had, a, had the same color front door, had a red front door. And this was not because of some government policy, this was because of the private sector taking control, business taking control of the redistribution of asylum seekers with government contracts and agencies to the point where people forgot. Business forgot to take care. It forgot to be considerate. It forgot to be, if you like, creative and artistic. It just did the job with the result being the increased ostracization of, the, of this community. So in a way, if you're running a museum like this, what role does the museum play? And how can we kind of re rethink the software rather than the hardware? And to do this, I often go back to this moment. Um, this is, this is a, a local artist for your consideration uh, in some <laughs> respects. Um, obviously, Kaspar David Friedrich's Wander Above the Sea of Fog, who I refer to consistently. I use this image a lot. And I refer to it as the box cover image for the software of modernity. So if you go to uh, your local computer store, um, buy your software, this is what would be on the cover. The genius artist, male genius artist, striding ahead, forging ahead, leading us to some future we don't know where, but our trust is in with this individual, this creative genius, slightly above society, slightly above everything else. And the software engineer behind um, uh, th this is Immanuel Kant who, in a way, set the ball rolling at the end of the 18th century, beginning of the 19th century, um, with really uh, his description of purposeless purpose and the disinterested spectator. And this duality 
in a way, created what we now know as modernity, in, certainly within art and within the museum. This idea of art as being autonomous rather than embedded in day-to-day -day concerns. So the question is, we got to this moment, post the crash, post globalization, where this model, this Kantian paradigm, this romantic idea of art, has suddenly come crashing down. The art that we now realize mostly serves oligarchs, the wealthy, the powerful, is not working on the day-to-day -day level. So what do we do with the museum? Can we just, we don't just, can we demolish it? Should we demolish it or should we rethink it? And in this particular moment, I, I kind of uh, refer to the sort of parabolic art of Western development of Europe, if you like, beginning in 1848 with the revolutions and ending in 1989, possibly with the fall of the Berlin Wall, with the, um, with the invention of the World Wide Web, however you might describe it. This is the sort of the territory we have occupied and that modernity has occupied and inhabited for the last hundred years or so. But we're now very much in another moment. We can feel it now. I think when I drew this diagram a few years ago, that was before we even imagined something like Trump or Brexit would happen. So rather than uh, carrying on with things, could we look again at the history within this, the pre-moment of this curve, and look at other voices which were not taking us down this route of autonomy, but taking us another route of ecology? And the figure um, who I find most helpful in all this is the 19th century um, British artist, art historian, political activist, or I often refer to him as the world's first socially engaged art practitioner, John Ruskin, who really was the, the voice in the 19th century who was against industrialization and its dehumanizing effects. He talked about ecology. He talked about global warming. He initiated conservation. He initiated Oxfam. A whole range of, of, uh, of, 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 of systems that, that, he, that he generated from Gandhi to the National Trust to the saving of Venice. But at the heart of it was this idea that he proposed that art should not be, in the Kantian terms, considered for its own sake, but should be considered as a tool for social change. Even in his drawings and his lectures, this is a sort of a, a, one of his uh, amazing lectures that he used to give, very performative lectures, with these large-scale drawings, a bit like Victorian PowerPoint, where he would talk about nature in terms of analyzing the conditions of humanity. This is from an 1872 lecture on tree twigs, which was actually a lecture on how society should organize itself with consideration for our neighbors. On the back of looking at people like John Ruskin, of looking again at reintroducing the idea of use value, of reintroducing the idea of how art works in traction with the world, not separate from it, and we, we saw that in our last presentation as well, about how the object has become totally disconnected from its everyday use, from, it, from the uses in which, it, in which it operates. Could we bring this idea back into art again to give it traction in the world and give it purpose? And it was at that point that we began discussions with the Cuban artist Tanya Bruguera, who had also been thinking along these lines. And other museums and institutions had also been thinking about these ideas and these converged together in what we called uh, uh, the movement of arte utile, art as a tool. And in 2012, uh, Tanya and I and the Van Abbey Museum came together to write a, uh, what we thought would define arte utile projects, useful art projects. And we wrote a kind of manifesto, the criteria, that these new projects, art should be, be define new uses for art within society. We should challenge the field in which we operate. We should respond to current urgencies. Art should operate on a one-to-one -one scale. It's not representing something, it is the thing itself. It is the job, it is the process, it is what's happening. We should replace authors with initiators and replace spectators with users. Art should have practical, beneficial outcomes for its users. We should pursue sustainability. And we should re-establish aesthetics, not as a consideration of art for its own sake, but as a system of transformation for wider society. This led to a kind of uh, a committee 
which led to uh, a website which would document and case studies from around the world, historical and contemporary, which demonstrated this way of working in the world. We created the Museum of Arte Util at the Van Abbe Museum in 2014. And in this exhibition was really a, a kind of a statement, a moment in time, to say, let us again look at art in other ways. Let us look at the institution in other ways. And look at examples like this, Amatogut, the silent university, which provides free education for migrants and asylum seekers and, 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 and works with their skills and knowledge. Superflex's Garana Power, which is for farmers. Um, uh, the Grisdale Arts Honest Shop, which is a community shop creating uh, and selling products for, by the community, which then uh, is sold in a shop with no staff. It just has a tin that you put the money in, but it generates money and projects for the community. Wochenklauser, which takes the, the exhibition equipment from uh, uh, museums and exhibitions and turns it into furniture for day-to-day -day living for the community. Um, shoes that help uh, migrants cross from Mexico into, into America with a sort of secret compass and, uh, and um, a map and so on in, 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 in the heel. Or this project, which some of you may have seen in Berlin not so long ago, which is um, the Institute for Human Activity, which is a project initiated by Renzo Martins in the Congo on the old lever plantations uh, to, to allow the plantation workers to regain control um, of their destiny, if you like. And the first stage of this was the creation of an art, uh, the Plantation Workers Art League, who produced traditional um, or, or sculptures, which they had been banned from making by the plantation owners, um, and made new sculptures from Congo River mud, which were 3D scanned, uh, and then they're recast, 3D printed, scanned and made in chocolate from the plantations, which is then sold on the market, and the money goes back uh, to, to the Congo, to the community there. Uh, which we showed at MIMA recently and acquired this work for $8,000, which goes back again to the community. But interestingly, as opposed to the, um, the, uh, the Berlin show, we, we showed the work not as Renzo Martins, but as being produced by the, by the plantation workers themselves. Um, or this project here, which is a bit closer to home for me, which is uh, in Liverpool, the Granby Four Streets project, which is not necessarily an art project per se, which is important um, in this equation, but uh, a community at, who wanted to reclaim uh, a, a, a neighbourhood on their own terms and redevelop the housing on their own terms using uh, an architecture collective assemble, um, making, remaking the infrastructure and the, and the housing and the furniture from the rubble, from the streets. Um, and this went on uh, with a little bit of help from me to win the Turner Prize um, in, in, in 2015, much to the shock of the art world, who were very annoyed and um, furious at the idea of a kind of non-art project or a, 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 a non-commercial or non-commercially viable um, uh, project winning, winning such a prize. In all this, um, we have, in a way, supportive literature in this movement, if you like, and, and there's, a, there's a publication called Toward a Lexicon of Usership by Stephen Wright, the Canadian academic, which we produce for the Van Abbey Museum show, which starts to introduce the new terminology. It talks about usership, emancipated usership, away from spectatorship, and it introduces terms like one-to-one -one scale, um, the coefficient of art, so whether or not something is art or not, but to what degree something is art. Uh, or things like hacking and gleaning. This is the new language of usership, which we could maybe talk about later on. But one of the terms that comes from this book is the Museum 3.0. And in a way, the term that I began to describe how we might start to repurpose the museum in Middlesbrough, taking this 19th century model and turning it into something else. And you might describe this very simply as Maybe the museum 1.0 is you put the great art in the museum, people come along to it, and they're somehow better for it. Museum 2.0 is something more recent, perhaps, is where you still put the great art in the museum, but you introduce participation. So people participate in the museum, but it's still to someone else's agenda. So the museum 3.0 is the place where co-creation really happens where people really come together to decide what goes in the museum, to decide how the museum is run, to decide what the content is itself. So you're bending the museum rather than knocking it down and starting it again. 
But in doing this, we had to think very carefully about how we would give license, how we would relinquish control of creative content. And we began this with a project called Localism, um, where we wanted, which was a kind of an antidote to in international uh, globalized modernity. It was an antidote to the international blockbuster and was an exhibition of art made in Middlesbrough from 1800 to the present day. And we invited the public to come and decide what should be in the museum, bring along what they thought should be in the museum, from art to non-art, but really to tell the story, to document their lives, even this is kind of quasi-Alfred Barr diagram of the history of art in Middlesbrough, and make the museum this storytelling device, this receptacle, in which we would build up during the show uh, the full story of creativity in the town on, a, on people's terms. And that involved um, the historical things like new Linth like Linthorpe pottery, Christopher Dresser's regeneration program in the, 19 in the 1890s, uh, which was pottery made from uh, the clay from the earth in the ground. And we restarted this also with artists from the community to make a new Linthorp pottery using the same clay, same, clay, same clay from the earth to make new wares, to teach people how to make um, new wares and bring this idea of uh, entrepreneurship and creativity back together and back to life again. So this idea of using history is also then very important in the museum as well. That we can look at past projects like uh, the Middlesbrough Settlement, where a, a, a communist sort of wealthy aristocratic family brought in German soldiers uh, in the 1930s in the Great Depression when unemployment was at 95% to teach them art, agriculture, design, a craft, culture, um, including on the left, Wilfred Franks, a designer trained at the Bauhaus who taught the miners how to make furniture, which then became a social enterprise, which we are now um, remaking again or picking up the baton using new technology to teach and make furniture now. Or developing the museum on the back of this as a place of production, not a place of consumption. So on the back of the closure of the steelworks, we also presented... Uh, uh, a memorial to the history of uh, the town, of its industry, but also looked forward to its future. So that the exhibition or the exhibitions started to service the real agenda in the town, which is promoting the new industry and developing new industry and technology in the town. So what begins to happen in effect is that the exhibitions and collections are no longer the main thing at the center, serviced by an education program and by public programs and outreach, but the public programs are the center of our program. The education is what we do. The public programs are what we do. The regeneration in the town, working in communities, is the program. And they are serviced by the collections and exhibitions as a tool to that wider civic agenda. Um, and the last moment, because I'm running a little bit out of, uh, out of time, um, is this project that we uh, did at the end of last year called When All Relations Are Equal, this building will dissolve, which is a statement that was um, originally um, conceived by the artist Liam Gillick to be on the front of the Home Office building in Westminster. This is the government headquarters for home affairs. We deal with migration. And it was never allowed in the end. I worked on Liam on this project. And uh, the government said, well, it's a little bit uh, esoteric and we're worried what the Daily Mail might say, so we're not going to use it. So I kind of kept this phrase in my head all along, and it re-emerged as the title for an exhibition to very much deal with the migrant issues in our town. Not to be representational of them, but to make a facility that works for that community, for these groups. So the, the galleries become a conference space, a discursive space. They're like the village hall, the town hall, and we provide resources and information and advocacy for these groups who have been disenfranchised. This is Tanya Bergera speaking at the RTOTIL summit within that, within that project itself. We did free, free food uh, at lunch times. We created uh, a library, uh, free access to technology and to, and to, and to web. Uh, we created uh, films to advocate for telling the true story of where they had come from, why they were there, and what they could contribute to our society. Um, and in that lead up, I also declared that 
um, MIMA itself should not be a neutral space. Because this, in a way, this is the voice of the 19th century romantic, that the museum should be disconnected, that it should not have a voice, that it should not be subjective. And in the lead up to the referendum campaign, I was very subjective in my um, stance that we should remain in the European Union. Um, in fact, lots of good that did. But um, nonetheless, the museum became a campaigning institution. It became a voice that started to have traction with the town that is now evolving as a key institution within the planning, within the construction of society of where we are. And so in a way, what I'm proposing is that the, the museum should no longer be thought of as the building, but that the processes in which it enacts in wider society and therefore intrinsic to transformational change. That's the end. Woo! Okay, yeah. I'm Ethne Nightingale. I was previously head of equality and diversity at the VNA, and I'm now researching child migration. I'm interested in your stance on the Brexit vote and whether that's had any comeback, i.e., people who may have been supporting before are no longer supporting you because of your stance. That's a very interesting British uh, thing. <laughs> sorry, sorry. No, it's good. I'm going to sit down and enjoy. Uh, no, not, 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 not directly. I mean, you have, you have to be careful because obviously your constituency in a place like that is, uh, well, 70% seven, in favor of Brexit. Um, but nonetheless, you're still a civic institution at the center of it. And I think if you do it, it's ha I always think it's how you do things, not what you do. Mm -hmm. So the manner in which you have this discourse, the way you're open to conversation and that you don't make it polarizing is, is really key. So I think also how you program the institution so it's not just all about migration, it's not just all about the traditional liberal uh, kind of anxieties that you perform through an exhibitions program, but you also include other voices in it as well, that you keep it mixed and genuinely diverse, then that way you, um, you, you don't ostracize uh, th th those people who you might expect to be against it. Um, so it's a question of, and again, this, this question of usership is really important. So, you know, when you ask the question of what does the, what does the institution mean, what does the museum mean, meaning is created by use. Meaning is not, you know, fundamentally embedded in any, any, any object. So how people use the museum themselves um, is, you know, it, I mean, this, this is democracy, right? This, 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 that's what defines the museum. So the museum becomes open to other voices as well and other, other uses and purposes.